Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. Got done preaching last night. Got in the van, bumping into a, I don't know what sort of seizure, but got a fever and all thing last night. Thank you for your prayers. It's been much better this afternoon. Amen. Amen. So... Praise God for His Word. Amen. Yeah. Let's all stand together for the reading of God's Word. Luke's Gospel, chapter 8. The Word of God tells us in verse 1, And it came to pass afterward that He went through every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with Him. And certain women, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, which ministered unto him of their substance. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. We thank you for struggles. We thank you for the beautiful day you've given us today. Thank you for life. Thank you for our families. Thank you, precious Father, for the privilege to gather in your house once again tonight. Amen. And I'm asking, Lord, you'll speak with us. Meet with us, touch our hearts. And then, Lord, I pray Christ would receive all the honor yeah. and the glory. We'll be careful to give Jesus the glory, for it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Beginning of the year, I begin a challenge to go through the book of the Bible per week, per day. Reading through the Gospels every single day. Now right up to Revelation, begin going through the Old Testament day by day. You'd be amazed when you begin reading God's Word what the Holy Spirit teaches you. Amen. Amen. And so I was going through here, it's about the third week of January. It really challenged my heart. Pulled out a couple messages out of here and preached it to our Indian churches. I preached it many times throughout America. One of the things about Luke's Gospel, Luke writes in a very definitive manner. Yes. He writes very specifically. Yes. And as a doctor, he writes with the details. Mm -hmm. yep. And I like that. And you go through this chapter 8, I'll give you a quick outline of it, of what the Lord has taught me. And you're going to find there in verses 1 through uh, 3, four women, or four types of women. My sermon, by the way, tonight only has 16 points, okay? <laughs> and we'll try to finish up very quickly. Preacher says he has, what do you have, 101 ways to cook what? 33 ways to prepare tasty worms. Okay, 33 <laughs> ways to taste worms. Yes, that's what he's preaching on tonight. All right? Amen. <laughs> All right? First three verses we are dealing with certain women. Then as you go down to verses 4... Through eight, we deal with four soils. And then you go down to verses 9 through 15, you have the four results. But you also have the four, what I call, controlling factors. And we'll touch on that in a little bit. Then the rest of the chapter deals with four questions. And if you want to go over to the book of Mark, you will see the four questions articulated very well. But three of questions are here. But I'm not going to get into all those points, but I want to just get into the first 12. We should be out of here by, what, 8.45? Amen. 8.50, somewhere on there, Amen. okay? Amen. No problem. The Word of God tells us the 12 were with Him. Jesus busy. Jesus is traveling. Jesus is active in his ministry. Do you ever stop and think about what it takes to take care of 13 men on the road? I took a team with me of um, three teachers, myself, and 14 students across India. That's a lot of planning. That's a lot of preparation. Food, place to stay. 
Now think about Jesus Christ and 12 disciples traveling. Somebody got to do the clothes. Somebody got to take care of breakfast. Somebody got to take care of the different activities. We don't stop and think about those things. But the Word of God tells us they minister. Now I want to show you the four types of women that minister to Jesus Christ. The Word of God tells us, number one, which have been healed of evil spirits. Healed. They have been delivered from the power of darkness. Amen. They have been translated into the light. They have been the chains of darkness that bound them. They are now delivered. And they understood they had been healed Amen. through the precious word of the Son of God. Amen. You see, it doesn't matter what binds you tonight, whether it's a habit, whether it's sin, pictures, whatever it is, there's a power of darkness behind you. Amen. Yep. Every one of these. Very up Rockward, I don't know, maybe you might have heard the name, I don't know what's going on. He used to preach a message. Mm -hmm. Huh? Beer of the devils. Sometimes I forget what it is. The devil is in every bottle. Okay, there's alcohol. And he, he preached. Behind every bottle of liquor, there's an evil spirit. Was that? Sure. But that's what we fail to understand. Satan has a power that grabs a hold of the life of a, any person. Once they touch it. That's why Colossians says, touch not, taste not, handle not. Yeah. Amen. Let me see, secondly, infirmities. That's sickness, is it not? Those that be healed of evil spirits, delivered from the power of sin, of evil powers, but also sickness. I've seen God do mighty work in healing. I praise God for deliverance. I praise God for His powerful touch. We've seen Him work in our own family. Amen. Yes. We have lost our second one, our third one. But by the power of Almighty God, God touched your body. You see, it's the infirmity of the flesh that brings depression. It's the infirmity of the flesh that brings discouragement. It's the infirmity of the flesh that brings people to do things they would normally not do. But they understood the power of the Lord Jesus Christ can take care of every problem in the flesh. And you'd see that infirmity, sometimes we wonder, why God, don't you take it out of my life? I've had back problems since I was 13 years old. Every doctor I tell, goes to, he tells me you need an operation. He had one doctor tell me he wants to take five of my lower bones in the hip, in the lower part of my spine, and fuse them together. You can't even go over like this if you get your spine fused. But by the grace of God, it's been so 22, so almost 18 years. Still haven't been touched by a doctor for that. Amen. I praise God for that. God gives deliverance. And so often we as people, fail to thank God for yep. his deliverance of the apartment. Yes. That's right. You know, I had a family when our first part of our ministry in northern India, Punjabi family came to our home. We had an older man who was translating the ministry for us. He was my wife's and I teacher. He was 83, 83, 84 years old. He knew Farsi, <coughs> he knew Urdu. He knew English, he knew Punjabi, he knew Hindi wow. fluently. And he, when the uh, Pakistani and Indian was divided in 1948, his family was still in Pakistan. He never saw his brothers and sisters, never saw his family again. But he married a godly lady, and they served the Lord Jesus Christ. But you know what? All the years that he was in his church, he never understood what real baptism was. At 83 years old, he came to me one day, Pastor, I want to take baptism. What you've been teaching from the Word of God, I've never heard in my life. So at 83 years old, he was one of the most faithful men in our church. Yeah. It didn't matter how much rain, how much sunshine. I remember very well, water well over six inches deep running down through our street because of the heavy rains. 
we get the monsoon season. And I hadn't planned on going on visitation that day. We go on visitation on Saturdays. Here he comes knocking at the door. <laughs> with little short boots, water full of, oh. little raincoat. <coughs> and he said, Preacher, you ready to go on visitation today? Amen. It's faithfulness. Hey, it's faithfulness. Amen. faithfulness. He had every infirmity you could talk about. His wife was laid on the bed. I don't know how many years. From the time we met him. <coughs> that spirit of joy. Of service. So often we take for granted. And we allow these infirmities to control us. And put us down. We need to let God control them and raise us up. Amen. His women that have gone to be delivered from the power of darkness. Delivered from sickness. Look at also. The Bible says, Mary called Magdalene out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna the wife of Chusa, heir of steward. Women of position. Women of position. Here's a position in Herod's palace. She was one of the stewards working there. She had the ability, she had the privilege to be able to say something and something got done. When God gives us a position, do we use it for His glory? So often we try to please ourselves, don't we? Right. Right. Put our family up. Get ourselves something. One of the sad parts about the Indian culture is when a man gets money or position, he will try to get his own family and everything he can possibly get out of it. I remember the uh, current prime minister, or governor of our state, chief minister. He had run for governor two times. Now, you know what his election line was the second time he ran for election? I got everything my family needs now. I'll serve the people now. <laughs> Literally said that. He was honest, wasn't he? Yeah. Corrupt old fellas, but he was, at least he was honest. I got everything my family needs. He bought all his family cars. He bought all his family property. He got the positions he wanted in the city. Now he says, I'll serve the people next, next term. Okay, we'll be back in. <laughs> Folks, what do we do? When we have a position. God allows certain people. Who are believers. Christians. To have a certain position. And they must use it for the glory of God. Here's a woman that had all the privileges. Of life. With a high rich position. But lastly we see. Women of possession. Hmm? And many others. Which ministered unto him of their. Substance. Amen. God doesn't allow everybody to have a Rolls Royce. But there are a few out there, aren't there? God doesn't allow everybody to be a millionaire. But there's a few Christians out there. I praise God for the ones we've come across. They've been helping the ministry. They've got a right heart. I always, tell, I always tell people, I know God didn't make me a millionaire because I wouldn't handle it wisely. I'm honest, I know. My wife knows she can take those coupons and she can take that money and she'll make it stretch out for two months. If I had that same amount of money, in two weeks it'll all be gone. <laughs> wow. God gives wisdom yes, to certain people. He does. Amen. You know, we have to know our limitations. But when God gives the possessions, what do we do with it? Consume it upon our own lust? Take and use it for the way we think? Oh! Temporary things of life. No, folks. They, the Bible says they ministered to him. Which ministered unto him. Everything you've been delivered from, every infirmity, every evil spirit, and every position God has given you, every single uh, money that has come into your hand, God has given it for a purpose that you might minister to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Is that what we're doing with it? For women. Let's keep going. And when much people were gathered together, and were come to him out of every city, he spake by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. It was trodden down, the fowls of the air devoured it. Some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it, other fell on good ground, sprang out, and their bare fruit and hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. 
Very simply, the parable is this. The Word of God tells us in verse 11, the seed is the Word of God. Amen? I don't need anything else. I have the seed. I have the seed. The seed is the Word of God. So very simply, we begin four soils. Four soils. I want to give an, uh, like an application in regards to these four soils. A sower went out to sow his seed. As he sowed, some fell by the wayside. What is the wayside? Look down there in verse 12, I believe it is. By those by the wayside are those they, are the, they that hear. They hear the word. When you're out knocking on doors, whether you're in the grocery store, whether you're on the job, there's people listening every day. They're hearing you. You may not be utterly speaking vocally, but they're hearing you. They're hearing. The Word of God says, they're, what's going on? These are the unprepared hearts. Unprepared hearts. How so? He says, it was trodden down, and the fowl of the air devoured it. As you go through the scriptures, many, many times you find the fowl of the air represents a false religion. False religion. Now look at down here in verse 12. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of the hearts. Did you get that? Satan comes along in the form of false religion and takes the seed. Yes, they've heard. And he takes the seed right out of their heart. You see, when you have the gospel, you cannot have your false religion. When you have the gospel, you cannot have materialism. Is Jesus and no one else. Amen. You can't have the gods and idols and Jesus. It doesn't work that way. Amen. Many people have tried that. You go into the false religions and you can begin to study. You can't have the Book of Mormon and the Bible working together. That's right, they yeah. contradict each other. You Amen. can't have the world through a translation of Jehovah's Witnesses and the Word of God. It's one or the other. Mm. Sorry, man. What happens? This false religion will every time take away the seed of the Word of God. Right. What controls these people? False religion. And I, as I was telling you earlier this week, we have people from every different culture of the world coming to the Western cultures. And they have in their mindset false religion. What are you going to do to counter that? You need to have the seed of God ready. Ready to give. Look, 1 Peter chapter 3, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 3. I always misquote this verse. So I'm not going to try to say it. Verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Be ready to give an answer. Those that have the false religion. I'm not telling you you've got to go delve into their false doctrines. You don't need to learn all about Hinduism to share the gospel to a Hindu. Amen. You don't need to learn all about Buddhism to learn share the gospel to a Buddhist. You definitely don't need to learn all the things the Jehovah's Witnesses are teaching to share the word of God. Why? We have the seed of the word of God. Amen. That will answer. But we have to give it with clarity. With a sanctifying of the heart. With humility. We're not here to argue with people. I tell our people all the time. I'm not here to argue with people. But if a man wants to listen, we'll share the word. Amen. We're talking with them. Same way here. Controlled by false religion and unprepared heart. They're not ready to receive the word until that false religion has been answered. It has to be answered. Can your religion provide this? Can your religion answer this? Can your religion, your belief, give you this? We need to be able to get an answer. Now what happens? What's the result? The result, the Word of God says, lest they should believe and be saved. As long as you've got false religion, folks, they'll never believe in Jesus Christ. 
we have to be able to answer the false religion. Yeah. Yes, an unprepared heart, controlled by false religion. Religion. And the result? They won't get saved. Let's look at number two. Number two. And some fell upon a rock. As soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And they, verse 13, they on the rock are they, which when they hear, do you hear that? They're hearing also. They're listening. They're watching you. They're watching your attitude. They're watching your prayer life. They're watching how faithful you are in church. They're watching your relationship to your pastor. They're watching your relation to your finances in the church. That's right. They're here. What's it say? Then they receive the word with joy. Do you get that? They receive the word. They're not accepting it, but they receive it. They hear, they receive. With joy. Then what's he going on? And these have no root. We have all kinds of these people in our churches. I don't believe they're saved. They can hear for a while. They receive for a while. They're the ones that are preacher. Can I do something? They're the ones that want to get involved right away. They're the ones that want to do something. But they're the ones that don't want to get the word. Sunday school time? I haven't got time for it. Prayer meeting time? Bible study? No, we don't have time for that. The right. Bible says, having no root. Yeah. You see, it's the word of God that's going to give you the root. Amen. A grounding in the word. What happens? Which for a while, believe. Mm -hmm. For a while, they believe. There's a lot of people like that. What happens? Some problem comes up. Little petty things. They get crossways with some member in the member in the church. They get upset at the preacher about something. Their opinions didn't matter in some situation. They get a little huff and they walk off. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. Human nature is the same. We are every place. Dear friend. This is a hardened heart. First of all, the unprepared heart. Secondly, the hardened heart. What controls them? The flesh. Every single time. Because the word is not controlling them, they're controlled by the flesh. What makes me feel good? What I should feel, this feel, I feel that way. No, my friend. In God's ministry, feelings don't matter. Amen. Amen. He says, what's the result? And in time of temptation, they fall away. Yeah, they get bitter, they get hardened. They're the ones that stir up the trouble, preacher. We still got love in them. Mm -hmm. Had a young man, I preached this. A young man came out to me after he was a pastor. How long can we love him? <laughs> mm -hmm. Keep on loving him. Don't give up on him. Had a young girl in our church. Would have been 2010, I guess it was. We were out, Carolyn. She made a smart remark to one of our other girls. I put my hand on her shoulder and I called her mother over. I said, I don't need these kind of comments while we're out, Carolyn. She got in a big huff. Wouldn't join us for the rest of the singing. Got back to our house. She chewed me up one side of the wall, down the other. Right in front of our gate. She said, I'll never step inside your door's gates again, uh, your gate or your church. Her father tried to calm her down. Her mother tried to calm her down. She wouldn't be listening to anybody. She literally walked three kilometers home. Mm. It was cold. Mm. But you know what? We kept on loving her. Amen. We kept on praying for her. Two years later, she started to come back to church. Amen. Amen. I went over there and visited in August, September this year. She came to me after one of the services and she said, Pastor, I feel like just reading the Bible and going to church is not enough for a Christian. I believe God wants us to do something. I said, you're on the right track. Amen. You're on the right track. You see, no matter how bad they are, how they live in the flesh, controlled by the flesh, 
We've got to teach them with love and let the Spirit of God control their lives. Folks, it takes a lot to get out of the flesh and the Spirit. It takes a lot of self-denial. You know what I mean? So she was. They're, they're going to be there. They're going to be the ones that walk away. They're going to be the ones that are going to turn their back on you. They're going to be the ones that betray you. They're the ones that are going to hurt you the most. Why? They're hardened by the flesh. Hardened hearts. Number three. Verse 7, some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. First of all, we had unprepared heart, controlled by religion. The result, they never get saved. Number two, a hardened heart, controlled by the flesh. Result, they walk away. But number three, we're dealing with a occupied heart. Things, the Bible says they got thorns. Huh? And the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Look down in verse 14. And they which fell among the thorns are they, which when they have heard. What are they doing? <coughs> they go forth. I know some people will disagree with me, but I believe these people are born again. They're born again. Why? They start to go forth. They start to go forth. Hmm? The Bible says, and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life. What controls these people? These are occupied people, right? They're the ones that are busy. They're the ones that are so busy they haven't got time for church. They haven't got time for missions conference. They haven't got time for the activities of God's people. Why? They're busy. In life. They're so busy making a living they forgot how to live. Yeah. What's happened? The cares of this life. Can I ask you a simple question? How many people in this room don't have cares? We all have cares, don't we? That's right. That's right. We all have responsibilities. We all have burdens on our hearts. But don't let the cares of the world control you. Amen. Don't let the problems of this life dominate your responsibilities. Don't let the problems and the struggle of family and kids and grandkids destroy your walk, your relation, your communion with your Heavenly Father. We need that on a daily basis. Yes, they're busy in life. Yes, they're active all the time, but they're out in the world active. They've forgotten the house of God. What happens? They are controlled by the world. Very sad to say. Yes, they're born again. They're on their way to heaven, but they haven't got time for God. What's the result? Look at that in verse 14. And they bring no fruit to perfection. Unfruitful Christians. Yes, they got life, are they? Yes, they're born again, but they're unfruitful. Why? Because they're more concerned with the world than they are with the things of God. Many, many Christians are like this in this world today. That's right. We're so occupied, <laughs> occupied in the wrong areas. Okay? Then lastly we see, another verse 8, another fell on good ground. And sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. <coughs> but that, verse 15, But that on the good ground are they, which in an honest and good heart. What kind of heart we have? Honest and good heart. First, unprepared heart. Controlled by religion. They don't come to Christ. Secondly, a hardened heart. Controlled by the flesh. They turn back every single time. They are not among us because they were not of us. Then thirdly, what was that? An occupied heart. Controlled by the world. Result, unfruitful in the things of God. The last thing we hear is here. A good and honest heart. A Christian.
Christian that's controlled by the Spirit of God. A Christian that brings forth fruit. He says here in verse 15, Our good heart, having heard the word. They all heard it, didn't they? What's the result? They keep it. We're not just to be hearers only, but to be doers of the word. He says, Keep it. Guard it. Live it. The reason 84% of our young people in our churches walk outside the church doors when they're 18 and 19 years old is because mom and dad do not keep, guard God's word in their very lives. Wonder why our kids walk out of church? Because mom and dad can make it real in their lives. Here's a man that takes the word of God and keeps it. He guards it. He lives it. It's real to him. It's not a facade. It's not just an idea of a glamorous cover. No, it's real in his life. Everything about his life lives on him. Controlled by the Spirit of God, the Bible says, and bring forth fruit with patience. And I think we have to underline that word with patience, do we not? Yeah. Huh? We want everything now. If you can't be here yesterday, better be here right now. No, we need to have patience. God's people must be patient. God's patient with us, is He not? Mm -hmm. I always tell our people, our young guys, when you get involved in ministry, remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. Remember how many times you fell down, somebody picked you up. Remember how many times you failed? Somebody prayed for you. Yep. Remember how many times you quit? Somebody strengthened you. With patience. Bring you forth fruit unto life eternal. Yes, the rest of the passage deals with core questions. I'm not going to preach that tonight. But I think it's a challenge we need to take our hearts. There are some problems in missions. We need to take an absence kind of look at these hearts. Look at the heart of the unbeliever. What hardens them? Hmm? What controls them? Do you know to be able to give an answer? Do you know to be able to live and deal with these problems? When we are in the mission field, right here in our churches, we see people walk in those doors. How can we deal with them? Observe. With patience. Take a lot of love. Why? Remember where you came from. Amen. Let's pray.